like taking a look at the Haggadah, talk to us yes. about that. Yes. So I think that we all have different things that we enjoy about the Seder. And some people might love the four cups of wine, which you should really enjoy this year. And if you can drink wine, um, some people... This is, hold on, hold on. I'm going to like, <laughs> for a second, say, if you don't usually care what if you have a favorite wine and you don't usually you're not particular about it at the seder like this might be the year to be particular about it if you're going to be on your own or you're going to be with other people like get a wine that you enjoy get a wine that you want to drink that's going to make you happy okay your turn <laughs> okay great so um you might enjoy Dainu, you might enjoy that song, you might enjoy that moment, you might enjoy just reading like one of those paragraphs every year you read the same thing, you're like, oh, that's my thing, or that's my song, or that's, you know, out of the 15 steps in the theater, that's the step that just, that hits me in the heart. I don't expect all 15 steps to hit you. I expect some of them you feel a little bit more connected to and some a little bit less connected to. And so I want you to pay particular attention beforehand to that part that you love about the Seder and just review it. Just take a moment tonight, tomorrow, the next night, just take a look at it, prep for it. So that when it comes, it's not the first time that you've done it in a year, you've practiced it and now you get to kind of perform. It's kind of like a, an actor before they go on stage, they prep for it. So take a few moments to prep and and pick your favorite part to prep for because I want I want you to enjoy the moment. I want this Pesach to be a moment that you remember, but I want you to remember it with a smile. I think that we're all going through an incredibly universally challenging moment where we the people, not just the Jewish people, but we the people of the world are just kind of being like crunched and smushed and we're stuck in our own places and and we want to come into this as as free as possible. We want to come out of it as free as possible. So the way to do that, one of the ways to do that is to have a plan going into it to figure out what you love, to practice it, and then to enjoy that moment that escorts you on that journey to freedom. I like that. I really like that. This is the first year in a really long time that I actually like downloaded something that a friend of mine wrote, like a Haggadah, um, guide or like accompaniment or whatever that kind of takes everything back to the basics we're so everything's going crazy right now and I know I'm just like I can't I, I need something but I can't just sit down and start digging through stuff and so I like that she had something so take a look around there might be people um also offering different guides I know there's a lot of stuff going around um Sunny had a great suggestion has a great suggestion um, to use a new Haggadah, something that you haven't used before, maybe so at the Seder, you have a little something extra to keep you busy, something extra to kind of just browse around a little bit, something that might have an interesting commentary or reading material to make the whole process different. Um, and I really like that. Aliza, talk to me about the Seder food. The lots of Seder food Ooh. okay so well, everybody, yeah. yeah this is your favorite food right so everybody i think everybody has their favorite things and you've all got your own favorite seder foods and maybe it's the haroset or maybe maybe it is the wine or maybe there's some people that love even though it's that bitter moment the salty water where it just you know it's that first thing that you're eating during the meal, the crunch of whatever you're eating with the salt, it just gets you right into the moment. Um, or some people love to make their favorite food so that at the meal that, that you get to actually eat something that you really love. And I like people to have comfort. And one of the great ways to have comfort is through comfort food. And so I would love it if you would think about What's your favorite Pesach food? What's that thing that you wait for every year and you're like, oh, it's going to be Pesach again. I'll have my little matzah and chocolate spread. I don't even care. It can be your seven layer matzah chocolate cake. It can be a matzah spread. It can be a special dish that you make. It can be a vegetable dish. It's meat. It, I don't even care what it is. I just want to know that that's your little thing that you make or you have ready for yourself and that you get to enjoy it so that when you're there, no matter what else, either you or anybody else serves, you go to that and you're like, mmm, aw, Pesach, that's my favorite. I really like that. And it should bring a smile to your face. If it does not bring a smile to your face, then you gotta pick something else. 
It only <laughs> if it brings a smile to your face, then it's good. If it doesn't bring a smile to your face, it's no good. That's that's the plan. Aliza, we didn't discuss this, but I particularly love this one because from my background as a um, health professional, one of the things that we talk about intuitive eating, one of the principles is actually the satisfaction factor, like understanding the role that food plays. And yes, food is fuel, but food, food is so much more than fuel. And the idea that emotional eating is bad for you is not true. Emotional eating is okay, as long as it's not your only coping mechanism. But comfort food playing a role, an important role in your life is very important. And so I love the idea of implementing that into the Seder at a time where things could be a little bit stressful in general. People are stressed out when there's so much going on and so much planning that was put into it. Um, and then especially now, whether you're going to be alone or you're with other people, but there were supposed to be more people or different people or whatever it is. So I really like that. Good. Yay. <laughs> All right. Um, and wait, you have to take a minute. If anybody wants to share in the chat and tell us what your comfort food is, I'd love to see what they are and, and to hear different ideas because no matter what my comfort food is, if you've got a better one, I might switch it. <laughs> Wait, but specifically Pesach comfort food. Like it has yeah, to be kosher for Pesach. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> um, the other day you mentioned something to me about redirecting tears and I like that. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so on... Pesach and this, you know, I was talking about dipping the carpas in the salt water and eating it and reminding us of the tears and, and even, even though this is completely connected to Pesach and the freedom that comes from this and this connection to God, in addition to having this intention and, and putting your heart and soul into it, I also want to leave a space for those tears that we are shedding also for the loss of not having our soulmate by our side this year. Because I know that the people, the singles that I work with, it, 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 it hits here. It hits so deep and it hurts so much not to have that person right there by your side and to use all of this energy that we're pulling in at this time, this communal energy of this sadness and this loss in what's happened to also include this loss of our soulmate and to include this freedom that we're coming into, into this freedom to go into the world to find them and for that person to be there. In the same way that we were free to go out and serve God, we are free to go out and marry our soulmate. They should appear before us just in the way that we are able to connect with God. And so to use these tears and use this moment of sadness to connect to something global and something extremely personal that's near and dear to your heart so that we can expand on this moment and, and use it for the greater good to kind of create that longing and draw that person towards us. Nice. Thank you. Um, let's just quickly go over some of the answers that we got for comfort foods. So we got white chocolate covered matcha. I'm assuming those like go together because they're on two separate lines, but white chocolate. I've actually never seen that. Have you? Um, I've seen chocolate covered matcha, but not white chocolate covered I matcha. Think, I think one year we did get like a wrap thing of white chocolate covered matcha. Really? Yeah, it was delicious. Yeah. Nice. We got beef jerky, chocolate, my daughter's raspberry dreams, lace cookies, um, anything that my mom makes for me when I visit, even if it's just tea is comforting. I can so relate. I can so relate. Um, matzo ball soup and brisket, oh. apple cake, blondies, Boston. I've never had a Boston cream cake on Pesach and I want in. I'm just going to oh. put it out there. That's, by the way, that's my favorite donut, although I don't eat donuts so often, but a Boston cream donut, so a Boston cream Pesach cake. I feel like I'm totally going to butcher this, but I'm going to attempt to say it anyway. This year, my favorite comfort food is also my favorite wine, which is Terra Vega Car Carmenere. I don't think anyone will know if I got that right or wrong, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Smoked meat. Yum. Elisa, what's yours? Did you say yours? No, I didn't. Um, I, To be honest, I think it's the Jarosa. Like, it's something that's so unique to Pesach that... It's not, I could make it any other time of the year. Why can't I? I'm not that prohibited from making it, but you just don't, nobody does. And then when you make it, it was also something that my mom always made. That was always a tremendous source of comfort. Um, and she passed away actually tomorrow, Monday is her, uh, no, Tuesday, I'm sorry. 
Monday night, Tuesday day is her fourth year site. Wow. So um, I will eat her the harosa this year in her memory, and ha it was her also her favorite holiday. So for her to pass away just before Pesach, and then the whole process of the whole morning period, like it was just like she was with us the whole time, and every Pesach it just feels very very interconnected. So wow. yeah, thinking of her as we make our harosa and eat it, and she she loved it. extra wine and extra extra cinnamon. She was always into extra everything. So it was heavy. <laughs> Heavy on the wine and heavy on the cinnamon was so good. I loved it. Really loved it. It's so, these things are just so random. Like mine, I, I guess I wouldn't have considered this a comfort food, but now that you're, now that you're talking, I love the egg. We have egg right after fish before we have chicken soup. We, yeah, everyone yeah. gets a whole egg yeah. and we eat it in salt water. And yeah. my dad remarried a year and a half ago. And so last case up was the first time I was with his new family. So from, like, it was my dad and me, and then her, and, like, five of her kids, and an in-law, and a grand grandson, granddaughter, her, like, so many people, oh, and all of their cousins, like, her sister, husband, and all of their kids, um, <laughs> adult kids, and everyone looked at me, like, like at us, like, we were nuts, because they don't do that, they don't do the egg thing. And I was just like, but this is pizza. What pizza right. about like a saltwater egg? So, so wait, I heard that that is symbolic of Tisha B'Av, that that's the symbolism that you eat it because Tisha B'Av will fall on that same On the same day? Yeah. Um, I know that definitely plays a role somewhere, but it's really symbolic of the carbon Chagiga. Also, also. That's right. why we have the egg on the car, and then that's like an, an a definitely right. another aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, broken matzah and coffee. My mom does that. Okay, wait, wait. Christina, I, gotta, I have one. I don't know what okay. Everybody's not allowed to get grossed out by this. I forgot. This is actually my favorite, favorite one. And if you know about this, I want to hear in the comments. And if you don't, you say like matzah kugel. Nope, it's worse than that. An egg? Okay, an okay. Egg. this is how we say it, and this is what it is, and you can tell me it's gross, but I love it, and it was our family tradition. It's called the matzah in the fishuch. Okay, the matzah in the what? Fish, fishuch. I don't know, that's how we pronounce it. It goes like this. You know, the jarred full uh, gefilte fish that has like that jelly in it? No, no, listen. No, I told you I forgot. Wait a minute. This is the best thing. I knew my husband and I were really, really soulmates when our parents started talking and we talked about Pesach and they're like, and the matzah and the fishach. And they were like, yeah, we do that too. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it must be that our relatives are from the same place. I've never heard of another family do this. So you take that jelly and you boil it and you add salt and you add pepper and then you take matzah and you break it up and you pour the fishach all over the matzah and the jelly and you soak it. Make sure it's good and soaked up and then you eat it and it's so good. I forgot, that's my absolute top. Sorry. I mean, if you like fish jelly, then I could see how that no, would no, be no, good. No, it's not jelly anymore. It becomes liquid, then the matzah soaks it up and then the matzah's all soft and salty. And, and the matzah's like fishy, yeah. fishy. Yeah. Does anybody, ew. <laughs> Thank you. It's an Thank you, Michael. It's totally, it's totally not a Sparty thing. It's totally an Ashkenazi thing. Yeah, my I know my last name's Ben Shalom, but my husband and I are Ashkenazi. Oh, <laughs> okay, so there's no, nobody else. An, nobody it's else not has an Ashkenazi this thing. It's an Eliza thing. No, I'm sorry, so you see, and my husband and I are Bashers. That's how we knew. You want to know how we knew we were Bashers? That's the real story. <laughs> I don't listen there. She may be a dating host, but that's not how you know if you're, you, you find your soulmate. If they no, like we the really, same we really only found that out. We only found that out after we got married the first Pesach when our parents spent Pesach together. And they're like, they made the matzah and the fish. Oh, we do too. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're the only two people in the world. But it's not. It must be people from where we come from. Don't worry. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> That's that's hilarious though. Um, <laughs> I'm doing 23 and me, funny. <laughs> I okay. I want to hear. So we were talking about for the people who are doing a seder for one, and I guess this could apply for if you're at a family seder as well. But you mentioned something about like singing and being a part of it, saying it out loud. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so that this is more if you were doing a seder for one. If it's you at the table and you're looking around and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do? read the Haggadah aloud, say it aloud. It's just like in davening. When we say our prayers, it shouldn't be like this. 
where we're just reading with our eyes. We say it loud enough that we should hear it. Why? Because those words transform us. And if we don't have a whole group of people that are doing that together, it doesn't mean that you don't do it. You still do it for yourself. You still say it out loud and you sing the songs out loud and you should hear it because it's going to transform you. And that's why those things should be done aloud. I'm assuming if you're with a, you know, say you're full of people, you're going to hear it, whether you're reading it or somebody's reading it. As you're going through it, you're going to hear the Haggadah and you're going to hear the songs. But when you're by yourself, do not think, well, I don't have to do it. I could just, you know, take a look at this page and flip it. But no, read it. Tell yourself the story. Listen to yourself telling yourself the story. It will transform you. Awesome. Um, I feel like there's a lot of talk going on about this on social media. Like, are we getting dressed up this year or are we not getting dressed up this year? What's your oh, take on that? I know, I know. You need fancy Pesach pajamas, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, I'm um, in. Okay, so here's my take on it. We should get dressed up. If you would normally wear your slippers to the table, right, because you're not going to put on your fancy shoes. So put on your slippers, put on your fancy Pesach slippers or your whatever slippers, but get dressed up. Get dressed up, again, not for anybody else. I don't even care if anybody else is in the room, for yourself. So that when you come to your Seder table, you aren't coming in your weekday pajamas or your Shabbos pajamas from <laughs> last week, but that you are actually coming and you should be freshly showered and you look like a mensch and you feel like a mensch and you show up and you look good and you smell good and you're like oh it's kind of like nice to be around me again like I forgot that I don't have to leave my house to dress up to look nice and I can do it even if it's just for me and everything like I brush the hair and you know put on your if you're ladies put on your jewelry and put on your nice button-down shirt guys and put if you would wear a jacket put your jacket on halfway through the meal if you'd normally take it off so take it off but come the way you would really come as if you were hosting the most lavish elegant beautiful theater and having a table full of people and come dressed and do it don't do any less for you than you would do for somebody else you're the most important person in the room whether there's other people there or not the most important person in that room is you and the only way to transform you is by playing the role and it's the same thing you you act things out you dress up you got to put on the clothes to look like it for Shabbos we got to put on the clothes so so we do different for weekday we do different for Shabbos we do different for Pesach so dress up and you'll see that it'll transform you from the inside out or the outside in actually on this case oh Sarah hold on I can't hear you did you get on mute? Because <laughs> I muted myself. Oh, good. Great. Some of, now I can I hear you. <laughs> some of the questions in the chat box. And Stop. apparently when I type, it's super annoying for you guys. Oh, yeah. So I put myself on mute when I type. Okay. Also, just um, love it and anybody else in the background, you guys are totally on mute, so you're fine. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, don't forget the kittel. Yeah, for any of the men that would wear a kittel, yeah. Go for the kittel. Make sure you're ready to go. Um, I don't know if we discussed this. Um, but did you talk about setting an, if you're doing a Seder for one, did you talk about setting an extra plate? No, not yet. Okay. Go for it. Okay. So we just did this at our Shabbos table because we love having guests and we have guests every single week, except recently we don't, which is so unusual for us. So I told my kids, we, I have five children and I told them to set the table for eight and they looked at me and they're like, oh, are we having a guest? And I was like, well, yes, but not a human one. And they're like, what does that mean? And I was like, set the table for eight and I'll tell you. So they set the table for eight and everybody took their usual seat. And then there was this one empty seat. And I said, we're unable to have guests now. Obviously there's, you know, so much going on in the world. And Hashem said, it's just supposed to be everybody in their own home doing their own thing. And we can't have anybody, but we are still setting an extra seat. And they said, well, who's, who's it for? I said, well, it really could be for anybody. Um, Last week, we set it for Bubby, for my mom, who's your site's coming up. I said, this is going to be Bubby's seat. And we went around and we talked about gratitude and the things we were grateful for and all the things that we might not have been able to tell her that we, we would have been so excited to call her on the phone and tell her. And we sat there and we spoke with each other and we had Bubby in mind that we wanted to share these things that were in our heads and on our hearts. And we wanted to have that as um, a placeholder for her. But I will tell you a couple years ago, um, all the kids had gone to bed early. We maybe were maybe we were sick that Shabbos. People weren't we weren't feeling so great, and it was just my husband and 
and me, and it was the two of us at the table. And I set the table for nine of us. Uh, and, and my husband comes to the table and he sees the whole table is set. He knows it's just the two of us. And he's like, what's going on, sweetheart? And I was like, oh, I'm so excited. We have so many guests. And he's like, we do? Really? Who's coming to our table? And I said, oh, we've got Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And we've got Sarah, and Rivka, and Rachel, and Leah, and you, and me. That's nine. And he's like, so lovely, sweetheart. I said, haven't you always wanted to have a meal with the Abos and the Imahos? And he was like, okay. <laughs> like, what does this mean? What does this mean? So to me, what does it mean? It means how do we bring people into our lives? How do we bring our past, our present, our future? How do we make that all one? And sometimes we have to get really creative. We are not God. We are not Malachim. We don't experience the world and time all as one. But if we experience the world all as one, we could be sitting at the same table with them. And so sometimes we have to get a little creative. And especially if you're setting a table, you don't have to set for one. You can set for two or three or five or 10. And the question is, who do you want at your Seder? And you're not limited by time. Past, present, future. Set the table for your spouse. Don't make it for one, make it for two. Imagine you are having the meal with your spouse. You want to have your kids at the table? Set the table for your children that maybe aren't there that you would wish to be there. Or set it for a parent that you lost, or set it for a friend, a relative, or a person in history, or a person in the future that you're hoping to meet. I don't care. Set your table, include at least one other extra place setting, and experience the Seder in a way that's different than just being there by yourself. Bring other people into your world, and then you'll actually experience being with others, even when the physical experience is a little bit different. It's just, it's a little bit in our minds, and it's a little bit in our hearts, and it's sort of in our reality. When there's another seat there, it's a little more in our reality when there isn't another seat there. You'll see, as soon as you put a second place setting down instead of one, just like put it down, pick it up, put it down, pick it up. It just feels different. It looks different. And it gets your mind thinking about things in a different way. And again, you should only do things that bring you a smile and bring you joy. If doing this is going to upset you, please don't do it. Don't take my advice. It's not good advice. It would be very, very bad advice. <laughs> only do it if it's something that can bring you joy. And if you can figure out a way to bring joy through it, great. This is an excellent tool for you. And if not, Pick a different tool. Try something else that might work for you. Awesome. Um, let's have you address one more point, and then I think we'll open it up to the questions. Okay. Um, you are kind of known for your blessings, um, and I find that you have this beautiful way of finding um, the silver lining in whatever is going on. So can you talk to us a little bit about that, how we could use this opportunity to find the positive? Yeah, it's so funny. Sometimes I get a little tongue-tied when things are difficult and and I don't always know how to, I don't want to say I don't know how to empathize with somebody, but I know that when somebody says to me like, oh, I know exactly how you're feeling or, oh yeah, I know what you're going through. And my, my brain is like, no, you don't. You're not me. Even if you've gone through a similar situation, you don't know exactly what I'm going through. You have no idea. Yeah, my mind, I've got my mind on like a thousand different things and all these thoughts are running through my, that's running through your head? I don't think so. We're not the same human being. There's no way that, that you know what I know. And, and sometimes to say like, oh yeah, I hear like, oh wow, what you're going through, oh, it must be so hard. And like that to me also doesn't feel good. And so I always go through my mind and I try to figure out what might make somebody feel good. And, and sometimes I think, no, I don't have any comfort words. And, and then I remember, I'm like, oh, oh, you know what? The only thing that I, the thing that I find comforting is blessings. You know, if something isn't the way that I want it, a blessing that it should be that way to help to create that reality, I'll take that. Or, or a wish, a hope, you know, that something should be in a good way from, from a sincere, genuine place. That makes me feel better. And so I like to do that for other people and to offer that as, you know, like I can't wave a magic wand and make it happen, but if I could put a good word out there, a good effort out there, if I could lift you up by by telling you what I wish for you or I hope for you or it should be that way and, and that like I think it, I feel it, I believe it, I'm with you in this to help 
actualize it, then I could do like one teeny little part of making it a little, little, little bit better. Then that makes me feel like I've, I've made an effort for you on your behalf and with you. And so I like to give blessings. It makes me feel better. Some people like to receive them, but they don't like to give them because it sounds awkward and weird. I totally get it, but it's kind of just my thing and it makes me feel better. But if I just think about you know, as you're talking to people, and even as you're talking to yourself, we have this self-talk that runs in our head, and sometimes we have these negative spin-outs that really draw us down, and instead we could use those words to pull us up. So you don't have to pretend like, you know, everything's going to be okay, and next year it's going to be my year, and you're like, yeah, but the other side of you is like, yeah, whatever, like, keep talking, it wasn't last year, it wasn't the year before, how do you know it's going to be next year, right? I don't want you to get into that negative self-talk where you have like positive, negative, and it's like jamming in your brain. I'd rather you just say something and like, please God, with your help next year, it should be that I could celebrate this with my soulmate, with my Bashir, right? Something that it's not that it's definitely going to be, it's my wish, it's my will, it's my desire. I'm heading on this track and that you can comfort yourself with your own blessings. And when anybody else gives you a blessing or hints towards a blessing, quickly say amen, grab it and make it your own and, and take hold of it. I really like that. And I feel like I would have, I, I wish I would have said this before you, cause I like that closing, but I'm going to add one more thing. Um, I am very much the kind of person who sees the positive and I always focus on the good. And um, I realize <laughs> I'm getting all my days mixed up. I realized last week, like, I don't even know what date it is, that I didn't give myself permission to just vent and complain and be sad and mad about everything that's going on because thank God I'm healthy and I'm with family and I do still have a job and all of these things that it almost felt like I don't get to complain. And that's not true. Someone else, because even if it feels like someone else has a, is worse off than me, that doesn't make my suck suck any less. It just sucks differently. My, my suck is not better or worse than your suck. Um, And so I think whatever the situation is, wherever you're going to end up having this data, it's okay to take a a few moments. And if you're feeling sucky, like sit in that suck for a few minutes, obviously don't let it take over and you don't want to be in that space the whole pace off. Um, But it's okay to to take a few moments and just like vent about it. If you need to cry, cry about it. Um, With that, we're going to open up to questions. I'm actually going to take the first question, if that's okay. The question is from Yassi, and he wants to know, am I in the back of a car? The answer is yes, because <laughs> thanks to everyone being home right now, and everyone streaming all sorts of things on their phones right now, <laughs> I don't have workable internet access at home. Um, and so I drive out every day to whatever parking lot I feel like driving to, and I work from the back of my car. And I even bought those little like plug-in things and I can, my laptop's plugged into the plug thing, which is plugged into my car, my motor's on. Um, But I am so dedicated and I am so here for Aliza that I am in the back of my car doing this webinar. (laughs) And for everybody here. So thank you for doing this in the back of your car. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. So question number one, actually we have two people who have questions along the same line, but Mm -hmm. Elon wants to know why is it that singles are seemingly so fixated on how religious enough a potential date is? Is that not judgmental? Um, And I believe this is from Ruth asked, how important is being on the same page in religious views actually? And I think you might have addressed this before, but it's a good question. So I'm going to let you answer it again. Okay. Not like you need my permission. Well, no, so there's like the, the why... It's why is it so important was the first part and the second part was... No, the first, but well, one part, I guess let's do them backwards. Um, how important is it? And why are people so fixated on it? Like, isn't there a judgmental piece in there that shouldn't be? Right. Um, I'm, and I'm going to take them in the reverse order. So sure. why are they so fixated? They're so fixated because it has a dramatic impact on your life. And I'll go through a few stories. Um, and, and share how it can or it can't work and why. And how, how, how much should you be fixated on it? So it depends on how flexible you are and how open you are to living a lifestyle that's similar to where you're living or meshed with somebody else's. Um, just for example, there are couples that are 
more religious and the nuances of the religious pieces make a difference. Like I would send my kids to school here and you would send your kids to school there. Or I would daven at this synagogue and you would daven at that synagogue. And therefore those nuances um, get, get very difficult because how do we as a family, like how do we as a family operate and move through the world? Well, we can't when I wanna do this and you wanna do that and then we're all in different directions and we're not on the same page. Um, the same thing goes if you're on the less religious or not religious at all spectrum, um, where you might say, you know, well, you know, I kind of don't care. It doesn't matter. Maybe I'm not traditional, but somebody else is traditional, modern Orthodox, and oh, I'll be flexible with them, but they might not want to be flexible with me. And maybe, again, also if, if it's kids, Jewish day school or public school, or if it's not kids, and we're just also talking about observing holidays you know, traditionally, consistently throughout the year, or just here and there, the holidays that I'm used to doing that I want to be doing. So it's hard to live life when you don't have two people that are on the same page. That being said, I have seen couples where, I'll give you a couple different examples. One is where um, the, the husband was um, not observant, the wife was, you know, modern orthodox, and they made it work. And he decided that he was going to be okay with being on whatever page she was on and that was comfortable for him although he they co compromised and he goes out to eat in non-kosher restaurants but when they go out together they they only go to kosher restaurants but he on his own um, will do whatever is at his comfort level so that's an example of making it work now could that work for everybody no should that work for everybody no, it works for the people that it works for. And there's different reasons why it may or it may not work. Um, same thing on different religious backgrounds. So um, again, with let's just say I'm saying these future kids that you may have, or if you're divorced and you actually have children and you're trying to figure out where people are going and what you're doing, making those decisions together as a family is really difficult when you don't have the, found, the, the commonality of what you're looking for. But if you come to a place where you're saying, listen, I'm into you, you're into me. These are our differences. I'm over here, you're over there. One, it's not over here and over here. One is not better and one is worse. One is not ideal and one is less ideal. They're different, two different pages. If you're on two different pages, it cannot be that we only meet in the middle. It just has to be, I'm here, you're here, and our relationship has to exist somewhere in the middle. And I don't know exactly where and what our relationship is gonna look like and who is going to make a compromise. And it's not, I give in this time, you give in that time, it's one for one for one. It doesn't work like that. But we together are gonna to commit to figuring out what does and what doesn't work for us. And it'll be a little bit of yours and a little bit of mine, and it will become ours, whatever ours is gonna look like. And that is an unknown. And for some people that's very, very scary and they'd rather just have like and like be together. And that's totally appropriate. So that's my overall thinking about it. It's complex and each situation is unique. Um, for what's right for one person might be totally wrong for another. Um, this is a follow-up question that I'm actually gonna twist a little bit. Um, but the question is, how do we not judge people on dates when they don't follow halacha? So assuming this is a person who has a strong value when it comes to following halacha, let's say they don't make a bracha. If that's something that's important to you, is it a deal breaker? Um, so I feel like you kind of addressed this in your last answer. So I actually want you to talk a little bit about um, deal breakers in general. Um, if you could, in like two minutes, give us your summary version of the role of a deal breaker and if you could almost touch on something that we've discussed in the past where a deal breaker isn't necessarily what we think a deal breaker is. Okay, let's start with the, the deal breaker. So basically, if you aren't okay with it, and you're going to be irritated, irritated by it every single time, and you're going to nudge this person for the rest of your life, this is not okay. They can't live like this. You can't live like this. This is not an acceptable way to get into a relationship. If you don't like it, if you don't love it, if you're like, wow, I totally would not have chosen that, but maybe I could figure it out and figure out how to navigate this because I, as a package, I like who this person is and this trait I don't have to like. I'm never asking you to like that trait, by the way. You're allowed to marry somebody who has traits that you don't like. In fact, you should know what those traits are that you don't like but they can't be a deal breaker. A deal breaker actually breaks the deal. It's like, oh, I'm allergic to smoke, you're a smoker, I can't marry you. 
if you quit smoking for 10 years, maybe we could talk about it. But other than that, like, it's not going to work. I'm not going to pretend like, like that's okay. I have had clients where they don't want a smoker, but they met somebody and he or she is a smoker and they're like, you know what? It's not what I wanted. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. But it's not what I wanted, but you know what? Okay. I've had dozens of clients like that. They're like, okay, you know what? It's not a deal breaker for me. It like was not my priority. It was not my preference, but it's not a deal breaker for me. Okay. So for them, so they could get married. You don't have to like it and they may never stop and they may do it a lot more. I can't make any promises about what's going to happen, but you just have to be okay with it. So that's the generic thing about deal breakers. Now, can I, yeah. Come on. Can I clarify the follow-up question? Yeah, um, let's say, I'll just use myself as an example because yeah. for me, smoking was a deal breaker. If a guy smoked, I didn't even give him a first date. I didn't even give him a phone call. Um, And then I ended up meeting someone, and before I knew that he was a smoker, I met him, and I'm now engaged to him, but it was a really big deal, and it took time for me to get past that, and and not just to ignore it, but to accept it. What happens, is it a problem if someone feels like something that was a deal breaker no longer is a deal breaker because they like the person so much? Is that a problem? Oh, yes. (laughs) <laughs> it's totally a problem. Why is it a problem? So it's a problem because a deal breaker is something that breaks the deal. And I don't know if you're changing because you're really accepting the human being or because your brain is confused and you're smushing it all together and you're just like brushing it under the rug and you're like, oh, maybe he'll really stop. Oh, he'll really stop for me because he really loves me, right? And you're just like pretending like that's not really going to exist. So when I work with people like you and other clients, you're not the first one, but and other clients like that, we go through this and we make sure that you know and I know that not only this is my expectation, not only is he never stopping, you should assume in your brain that he will probably do it more frequently. Why? Because life gets more stressful and the habits that we have we get into a little bit more. And so as long as you're okay with that reality and you understand that that is what is normal in a relationship and that is what's normal with a human being, and you tell me you're really okay and I tell you he's really not gonna quit like a hundred times I tell you that and you're still like, no, really? And I'm like, yes, really? It's never happening. It's only gonna get more frequent and you're like, okay, I can deal with it. No, really, I can deal with it. Until we have that banter back and forth and like, I'm sure that you're sure that you know that this is never gonna change then we're okay. If it happens to change, you're like the lottery winner. Woohoo! I can't hear you. All of a sudden. Can everyone else hear Lisa? Because if you can, then I'm just going to let her keep talking. Why is my internet? Oh, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. I think it was you. I couldn't hear you. Oh, that's weird. Okay. My internet connection for a minute said it was unstable. It's back. So, um, yeah, so I like to make sure that I dig in and I make sure that you're very, very clear that that deal breaker for you is no longer a deal breaker. It is a habit that you have to accept. You don't have to like it, but you have to accept it. Awesome. Um, and I got distracted by a question that just came in. I did have a follow-up one to that. How do we know if we could handle the things that we don't like in our future spouse? Yeah, we don't know is part of the problem. So my advice in general, this is like without having a detailed background, is to have you date them longer so that you can experience those things that are not your favorite things. Now, there's always going to be surprises in relationships. You get married and you're like, oh, I didn't know about that. Might not have married. You had to known about that. And then you're already married and it's just too late. We're not talking about those things. We're really only talking about the things that you know about. And my preference is that you date longer so that you see that thing. You experience that thing. You experience your reaction to that thing. You see how consistently it happens. You see how well you do or you don't handle it. You see if you get better over time at navigating it. You see if you get more irritated over time at handling it. So I, I go based on the person and the length of time. I need a longer period of time together to know if it's really going to be a problem for you. If you consistently date them and you see that 
you don't like it, but you keep being able to navigate this relationship, even though you don't like it, then that tells me that you actually have the skills to handle it and to be okay with it. And so I'm not as worried about it, even though it's going to be one of those like irritants in your relationship. It's kind of like that thing under your skin that you're like, get out, like a splinter, you know, you're like, but you could live with it. You're not going to die from a splinter. Like it's just going to irritate you. Okay. So it'll irritate you, but you'll have the ability to handle it. I'm okay with that, but you gotta, just gotta live with it. When I say live with it, I mean experience it through the dating process. All right, um, how could a couple work to satisfy their different emotional needs? For example, one person wants to talk more and the other wants to talk less, um, or one feels a need for more emotional support and doesn't feel satisfied. This is a tough one. This. Um, this sometimes completely breaks up couples and sometimes it's for a good reason and sometimes not. So emotional connection is really difficult to satisfy because we basically normally are satisfied by multiple people in our lives, right? So it's not just your mother or your father or your sister or your brother or your best friend or your neighbor or your friend or your mentor or your somebody or somebody, right? It's a, it's the combination of all of those people that help us to feel emotionally satisfied. And then we find this person that's our person and you get into a relationship and our normal expectation is they're going to make us feel great. And I don't need to count on anybody else for any of that emotional support. They're going to be my person, the person, the one person in the world that should be able to emotionally satisfy me. And that, my friend, is where we have the problem. The problem exists where we are not going to be satisfied by that one person. And in addition to every other person in the world that needs to satisfy you, the most important person in the world to satisfy you is you. You have to make sure that you know how to satisfy yourself, that you know how to meet your own needs. And we can't just count on everybody else in the world to meet your needs. So this brings us back to the question of how do we balance these different needs between us and the person that we're with, knowing that they're not going to be able to give us everything we need. How do we know if they can give us enough of what we need? So I'm just trying to think of like a percentage of the time. So let's just say at minimum, we want 50% of the time this person to be able to comfort you, to be able to be there for you in the way that you want. Somebody should be able to get it right 50% of the time, okay? Maybe if you're more connected in sync, somehow more on the same page, emotionally in tune, maybe they're going to be able to do it a little bit more like 75% of the time. But mostly what's going to happen is we're going to have to teach people how we want to interact and how much interaction we need. Um, I recently had a couple where one of them needed more of an emotional connection, more of the talking, the connecting, the working through things. And the other one just needed less of that and didn't feel like they could ever fulfill the other person's need. It didn't matter what they did. It was just so draining on them because what this person needed was up here and what this person could give was down here. It wasn't any better or, or any worse. It just wasn't a match. And even though they both kind of, stepped down and stepped up to where they needed to be, they were still not enough of a match. And at the end of the day, one side said, you know what? I can't do this. I tried. We went out long enough that I really made my full effort, but I really, I, I can't. It's too much for me. It's so draining on me. Who I am is not enough for what they want and need, and I could never fulfill that need. And so that was a, a relationship where it didn't work. I've also seen the opposite where couples were able to work it out and both sides kind of came to that middle and we're like, you know, you know what, it's enough. And when I need more talking it out or schmoozing, I'll call somebody else. I'll have one of my other lifelines to reach out to and my partner and my spouse will be the, for other things, but they're not my everything and they're not my only thing. And I think that's an important lesson anyway. If you're struggling through this now in dating, you will definitely struggle through it in marriage. And so you should try to get to a comfortable place in dating. Once you get to a comfortable place, then I'm okay with the relationship progressing. But if you're consistently uncomfortable, then we have a problem. Got it. Um, I want to throw something in here. And Aliza, you can tell me if this was a unique experience or if a lot of people have similar experiences. But one of the things that I found that you really helped me in terms of coaching was I 
had expectations of what I wanted from the relationship and how, what I needed and how much and how often. And I felt that I wasn't getting it until I realized that my circle of friends is, they're all very similar to me. They all think the same way. They all, we all interact the same way. And he is totally not like that. And so I had to learn what his giving means and what his communication means and what it doesn't mean. Like I would read into things that he was totally not saying. Um, and so working with you, I, I learned how to understand him and what he was giving me. And that helped me, obviously, aside from having other people to fill different needs in my life. Um, aside from that, I, I was able to, to learn how we communicate and how we interact in a way that fills what I was looking for, even though it wasn't the way I was thinking I should get it. Right. So your, your situation is not unique. And a lot of people experience this where they are getting certain needs filled, but they didn't realize, like, it's not how they're used to getting it filled. And they don't necessarily like that way when it first starts, because it's so different than what they're used to getting. And then when they realize what's being offered and how they're receiving it, and they have this whole shift and understanding, then they can, like you, become comfortable with it. Some people become comfortable with it. And they're like, that's great. And the other people are like, no, no, no. I want anybody whose brain works differently than mine. I want somebody who's totally like all of my friends. I want somebody that's exactly the same. So um, yes, I do work with a lot of people through this process of understanding how somebody gives and what that means. Um, similar to the five love languages where everybody has a different mo mode of giving and receiving that feels good to them. And you might be speaking a different love language and both are great, but you just have to know that this is what works for you and this is what works for them. And then it's kind of like when you actually understand the way something works, you're like, oh, okay, wait, let me readjust. Let me go back, experience that situation. And then I can get to a place where I could value it. I could appreciate it. But I don't think that value and appreciation and that buy-in is there until there's the understanding. And so I thank you for bringing up that um, personal example. And thank you for sharing your story because a lot of people express this and, and work through it. All right, you're welcome. Um, you, I know you just touched on this. If you answered this question, just let me know. I was like trying to keep track of everything. So I didn't totally hear, but last week you mentioned that during this coronavirus time, um, with video dating and everything, we need to make sure that we keep a strong community of friends and, and a strong network. Um, and that the, our date should not fill the essential hold on why is it bad if your date fills the essential role of being a connection filling a void so i know you just touched on that but i don't know if you address this specifically no so specifically for this time period when somebody's filling that when we have this emptiness within us and somebody comes to fill it so now i feel full which is great and then when they pull back and they take their own space and time which they will at some point then you're going to feel this emptiness and this void again because they came in and they left but you didn't fill that space so if that space is full, but there's other people in your life and other people that have filled that void and that person is also a piece of that puzzle, then when one piece falls out, the whole puzzle is basically intact and you're still a full, intact, emotionally healthy, well-rounded, balanced, grounded human being. But when that person pulls back and there's nothing else to hold the stability of you together, then you kind of fall apart. Why didn't they call me? Why we have a routine? Don't, don't they like me? I don't understand. What's wrong? Why? We, we used to talk three hours a day and now we're only talking once every, what's happening? And all of a sudden, all these things start going on and it gets overwhelming. And then your confidence gets lost and your stability gets lost. And, and the core essence of who you are just starts to fall apart because this person came in to fill something that they shouldn't have had the right to fill all themselves. So there has to be this soulmate center spot for somebody to come in, but the spot that you need to fill is much larger than that. And so we need to make sure that you have a well-rounded and well-balanced self and that you have friends and family and people that you're communicating with through the phone or through video and that you're getting all these other needs filled and that there's still a space for somebody to come into your life and that will leave you whole with or without them. Got it. Thank you. Um, there are a bunch of questions coming in specifically around dating during coronavirus, questions about how to make video dating a little bit more fun. 
So what I'm going to do, because we addressed that last week, we had a really long, amazing information packed um, webinar. I'm going to put the link, we're going to send out the link tomorrow, but I'm also going to put it right now in the chat box for anyone who wants to watch it later tonight. Um, and pretty much all the questions that are coming up in the chat box that are related to that will be answered in the webinar. And we also sent out um, links to other ideas of dates and things that you could do. So we'll send those out in the email as well. Perfect. Um, is it possible to be with someone while, they, while they're while they working through baggage from a previous relationship without sacrificing your own needs? Ooh, tricky question. Okay, so on one hand, we're all working through baggage of some sort, whether it's a previous relationship or other stuff in our lives. And on the other hand, if you're working through baggage from a previous relationship, how, that relationship space within you is being taken up by somebody else and your brain space and your heart space is being dedicated elsewhere. So I would kind of want to know where they are in that process. So if they're at the beginning of dealing with baggage, then no, I wouldn't go out with them. If they're in the middle of dealing with baggage, I would also probably say not so much. It's not good timing. If they're at the end of dealing with the baggage and they're almost or mostly over it and they're kind of just letting you know that there was just a few minor details or things that they're letting go of, then we could talk about it um, and consider going out with them. If somebody is divorced, widowed with kids or has a complex situation and that's the baggage that we're talking about, which is a totally different baggage than, you know, I fell in love with you or my heart belongs to somebody else. But if we're talking about baggage baggage, then it's really very personal. So some people will never stop dealing with baggage because they have an ex and they share custody and the, the things between them are just constantly going back and forth. And if you marry them, you're just going to have to be a part of that whole picture and deal with it with them. So those types of things are ongoing. Still, I would want somebody to be not in the beginning of dealing with baggage. Um, if it was that kind of baggage somewhere middle end where like they kind of sorted out the heavy stuff. And there's like minor lifting to do. Like we're not lifting 50 pounds and, and, you know, repeating over and over again. It's like five pounds and it's annoying. And after a while you get tired and fatigued, but like it's only five pounds and it's not 50 pounds. I'm like, okay, so I could handle that. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. On a more personal note, how could we work on being more emotionally vulnerable? I don't know if that's a you question or a therapist question, but you'll tell me. Yeah. I mean, I, for sure, you could talk to a therapist about that. Yes. Um, I deal with that a lot. And I think we have to define what is emotional vulnerability. So emotional vulnerability isn't that I dump all of my baggage on you and I share all of my deepest, darkest secrets. And now because I opened up all the skeletons in my closet and I'm sharing with you that that's vulnerable. Vulnerable means that I am willing to share something personal, something intimate, something that I don't share with the world at a moment that's appropriate and healthy with you. And the purpose of me sharing this with you is to connect and, and to build and foster and nurture this relationship. And because I want to share something with you because you're becoming special and important to me and me to you. And, and this is something that I think is important for us, for me to share, that it has purpose that it's not just a piece of information. So um, I don't like when people do like a verbal dump where it's just like, oh, I have to get close to you. So let me tell you about this time in third grade. And then, you know, with my family and with my father and with my mother and with my best friend, and this always happens to me and over and over again, it, this is not like a negative spin out talk. This is like just at an appropriate moment as you're having different conversations that you just share something a little bit more personal that you might not tell everybody. And it, and it doesn't always have to be neutral or negative. It could be something positive. It could be this hidden gem that you just don't share with everybody in the world. I just want to make sure that we don't call vulnerability um, and, and call it something that it's not, which is this negative spin of, I'll just tell you all the awful things that happened to me. Like on a date, this girl once went out and this guy is telling her how he had the worst most horrible vacation ever or whatever. And he was feeling like he was so vulnerable. He was honest. He was real. He was with her. And she came back and she's like, he's so negative. And I was like, oh gosh, what did you like about him? And she was like, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't focus on anything else. 
because he, he, I just was focused on this story. It was so negative. I was like, you got to go out again because I want you to see what you actually like about him. This isn't who he is. Maybe he was just open and trying to be vulnerable and just it didn't hit the spot. And so she did go out again. And yes, it did end up working out. And this is one of those, yay, they got married and had kids and it, you know, happy ever after, but with lots of work along the way, right? But but it doesn't just mean it's a negative story. So um, actually, I would love to put um, Brene Brown has an excellent maybe TED talk or video. I was about yeah. to bring up something. Yeah, to we should that. just put a link there because she <laughs> talks about vulnerability in a way where she's the expert and I am not. But you've got to know the difference between vulnerability and what I would call like verbal diarrhea. You can, you I just think the them. best piece of advice that I heard, and this was related to business because I went all vulnerable and put my whole story, um, business story, and it really, it really worked people related to it. But then at a certain point, there was something wasn't right. And the best piece of advice that I heard when it comes to vulnerability is vulnerability is only good if it serves a purpose. And so it could be a beautiful thing and it could be a great gift, but what is the purpose? Is there a reason that you're sharing this information? Um, and is that reason a good enough reason to bring it to the table? So it's super important, but there's the right piece at the right time and why. And right. I, I find that really, really helpful. Right. Totally. Thank you. Also, I just want to let anybody know, if you're on this webinar and you signed up for this webinar, then you're on the email list. We added you so that you can get the follow-up. So don't worry about it. Um, and don't, I don't know, check your spam. If you don't see anything by like tomorrow night, check your spam. Definitely check your spam. <laughs> and if you're still not getting it, um, reach yeah, out. Coach, coach at marriagemindedmentor.com. I'm going to put the, the email address in the link. Sometimes what happens is if you might have been subscribed a long time ago and at any point you unsubscribe, um, we can't send you emails unless you resubscribe legally. So if you ever, this has happened a few times where someone's like, why am I not getting on my email? And it's, because if at any point you unsubscribed, we're not going to just keep spamming you. Um, not that Aliza's content is spam, but you get what I'm saying. So just reach out if you find that you're not getting the emails and it's on spam. Um, Aliza, I have a question for you. Again, I don't know if this is the right forum, but this is actually a question that I've heard um, come up more frequently um, than, than I think people would imagine. It was on a fourth date where the girl disclo disclosed that she was attracted to both genders. So unlike someone who's gay or lesbian, it goes both ways. Should I continue with, with someone who's bi? Um, should I continue with this girl? Oh, that's a new question for the open forum. Um, okay, so question, like if I were working with you, I'd be like, okay, so, you know, what would be your reason for not continuing? Um, when we're looking for a spouse, we assume that the person we're going to be with is going to commit to us and we're going to commit to them and like, that's it. We're done. Like, I don't care what your preference is, you know, like what, whatever your preference is, it is. But like, once you pick me, you picked me, like you're not picking anybody else in the world. Your choice is done. Um, a reason to not continue if it's going to drive your brain crazy for whatever reason and you totally can't handle it, that would be a reason not to continue. Um, and no judgment, like everybody's brains and hearts and everything function in different ways. And um, if, if it would bother you and therefore you would be nudging them or whatever, like if it would continuously ruin your relationship because you'd be bringing something up, that's going to be a problem. Other than that, is there an issue? I don't know. You tell me, is there an issue? I don't, I don't necessarily think that there's going to be an issue. At least I think it's, and I'm sorry if you just said this, but I think it's kind of like the same way, even once we're in a relationship, whether we're dating, we're engaged, we're married, it doesn't mean that I'm never going to notice a guy again. And it doesn't mean I'm never going to be like, oh my God, he's hot. Um, it just means it's an observation and it moves right past me. And I think that's the same thing with someone who is attracted to both genders. Those, so those same attractions will be there, but it doesn't mean anything outside of a relationship if you're in a committed, trusting, loyal relationship. Right. And it doesn't mean that they like every human being that passes in front of their eyes. Like we still have preferences. True. So yes. the majority of the people, they're really not going to like anyway. So um, I, I would say that as long as you can handle it and, you know, you like them and they like you and there's something there, you can move forward. 
Um, all right, so we have a lot of questions that are kind of vague-ish that I can't even make out. Um, some of you asked questions that I needed a little more clarity on, so I responded. Um, so check the answered questions. I may not have responded to directly, but I need a little bit more clarity just so I can pass it on to Lisa. And someone asked what, what book was called. Did you reference a book? Oh, are you talking about Brene Brown? Did you reference any other book? Uh, I'm thinking if I reference the book, I don't think so. I think we just... Anything by Brene Brown is awesome. She is like the queen of vulnerability, I feel like. Um, and I'll, I'll write that name down here. Ooh, I like this question. Why is it that people were able to make marriages of convenience work, like arranged marriages? How come we cannot rely on that nowadays and make any marriage work, even if we do not necessarily like the person? You know, those were kind of different days. Um, it was a cultural, social norm to have people set up that you get married, that you make it work. Like it was, it was the way that society as a whole was functioning. And we didn't know any other way. And we didn't, even if we knew another way, other ways might have been unfamiliar to us. And so that was a cultural and a common norm. And so people that still live in that way right now, they still do it and they still make it work and it still continues to work for them. The reason it doesn't work for a majority of us is because we don't, we don't behave in that way. So we date online and we have lots of options and we look around and our friends are dating people and we go to lots of events and gatherings and like all of a sudden it went from like, oh, you will marry this person to free choice you choose who you want to marry, totally up to you. It's not up to me. And we as people and as human beings no longer want somebody else to make that decision for me. So if you could imagine, if I tell you, listen, we're going to make your life easy. I'm going to choose your soulmate. You are going to get married and you're going to live happily ever after. It's going to be fine. You'd look at me and be like, are you nuts? No way. I would never leave that decision to you, no matter how much I trust you, Elisa. There is no way I would leave this up to you. Why? because you've experienced too much in the world, too many people, too many experiences. Like, you just know that there's so much out there and you want to pick, you want to choose. If you don't mind somebody else choosing, tell somebody to set you up and just go get hitched. It's not a problem. We could totally make arranged marriages happen. We can bring it back in style. For anybody who lives in a community like that, it does still exist, but you have to be somebody who chooses to stay in that mindset to make something like that work. You could make anything work in theory if you put your effort and your energy into it and you built it. You, ha you have to build it, but you also have to trust the people that are doing this for you. And most of us at this point in our lives, I don't think would do that. So I, I, you know, like on one hand, it would be so much easier. On the other hand, you lose your freedom of choice. Same thing. What if I tell you like, you're going to be whatever, a doctor, a lawyer, a welder, I, I give you a job and this is what you're going to do. No choice. You don't pick the college. I'm telling you where you're going. I'm telling you what you're doing. I'm telling you what's happening next. And you just do it. And then you do it and you live your life. And like, you don't know any different because you didn't have so many desires. I think that our the world got a little bit out of hand and maybe Hashem is reining us all back in, but we became people who had so many desires that our desires could just never be filled. And so we just kept chasing after more and more bigger and better dreams faster and easier and like still we're we're home and we're in lockdown and i could still get amazon to my door in two days sorry if you're in a place that you can't but i can amazon still comes to my door two days later i my heart's desire click click pay poof it appears at my door so we expect it to work like that with our soulmate it doesn't and if somebody else tried to do that for us i think we would all just flip out <laughs> But it can be done. Um, it is a mindset. It is totally a mindset reset and a mindset shift. Awesome. Um, we got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to ask Aliza a few more questions. I'm also going to put um, in the chat box the link to the 15-minute session because some of the questions here are a little bit more personal that I don't know would benefit from having you answer on this kind of platform. Um, so if we didn't answer your question, that would be a great way to get that answered. Um, reach out to Eliza. Um, how to know if a guy is controlling when stating what he wants in a relationship? And I'm going to add on to that. How do we know when something is a red flag and what, like, what's normal behavior that we're not familiar with versus an actual red flag? 
Okay, without specifics, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I had a case recently within the last couple months, and she started telling me the list of things. And within the first, I mean, 10 minutes of her giving me a download of what was happening, I was like this in my head. It was it was a phone call session. And I in my head, I'm like, oh, my gosh, no, no, no. Like, there's nothing she's going to say that's going to make me be like, oh, yeah, this relationship is fine. And the more that she got into it, the more and more concerned that I got. Um, seeing multiple behaviors that are controlling, controlling with language, controlling with uh, looks or style preferences, controlling with money, controlling with, um, it could be, you know, hashkafa and your outlook on your Judaism and your life and what's going to be. And like somebody else telling you, no, this is the way my life is going to be. And that's it. And like, you have to always conform to me. If somebody is constantly making you go all the way to them and that their way is not only the only way, it is the right way. And there are no other options for you. Then that's somebody that is controlling, that is going to be problematic. Most people obviously are more subtle than that, but it's that that tone, that feeling, and, and also that gut feeling. If you have that gut feeling of like, something's off here, like I want to like them more than I like them, and I want to give somebody the benefit of the doubt, and we are supposed to give people the benefit of the doubt, we are also supposed to trust our instinct our intuition, our deep understanding. And we are not supposed to only rely on what we see or what we hear. We have to process that information in our brain. We have to know what our heart feels and then we have to get in touch with our gut. So it's really like this three part checking system. And if you have anybody in your world that knows this person, family, friends, anybody, and they can give you a reference or you can get more information that would also be super helpful. If you're really, really not sure, this is not a 15 minute get to know you kind of thing. This is like book a session and we can talk about it. Pretty much if you have a, if you've been dating for a long enough period of time, we could, we could do it in one session. We could get an answer and clarity whether this is a danger zone and problematic. And I could explain why based on your specific situation or whether this is something that's safe that doesn't concern me. And again, I could explain why. Awesome. Okay, let's get 10 more questions and let's make them one minute each. Um, so quick question, quick answer. Um, at what point in a relationship is it appropriate to ask about any mental health or medical issues? Yeah, so I don't want to give you a date number and I don't want to give you a timeline, but I'm going to try to do both anyway. So if I had to say a date number, if you're somebody who would date only 10 dates and then you're getting married, so by midway through, by three, four, five, five, somewhere around there, you've got to say something and give somebody a hint or a clue, or you could ask and it would be appropriate. If you're somebody that plans on dating for, you know, months before you'd even think about getting engaged, it has to be at a point where I'm committing to you, you're committing to me, we're not really seeing anybody else, and like, I'm comfortable. Like, I like you enough that there's potential here for you to be the one. And I should probably tell this to you now. You shouldn't be at the, I don't know if I like you. I don't know if you like me. We're still figuring this out stage. If you're still figuring it out, you don't owe anybody any information. If you're just at the point where like, no, there's some investment here. There's something a little bit going on here. Then it's worthwhile to share very personal information. That's the one minute. Did you say that if you're like right wing and you date just a few times and it's different? Yeah, I said it's like three okay. dates three to five something right like okay how would you respond to being turned down for not having yichus like okay. family background okay so you right yichus is um i don't know how you want to explain it like i'm not good with dictionary definitions but like it's it's like family heritage no family family background lineage status background. status kind of okay but status, spiritual status in your family, spiritually, in lineage. Um, so this is difficult. There are some people that are very in the box, and this is extremely important to them. And that's it. I, yet I couldn't convince them otherwise. Nobody could convince them otherwise. For them, you should look for it because that's the only thing that's really going to satisfy you. For somebody that is a little bit more flexible. Um, a person is a person and the person that you connect with is the person that you should marry. And if they come with what you need in the background, great. And if they don't, you should see if you could get over that because you'll bring your own special lineage with you. And, and that'll be a part of the history that you build together. Um, 
and being with somebody that you match with is really important. Like, would you rather be with somebody that you don't match with, but they've got the history? I don't think so. So finding somebody that you match with is to me the most important thing. If that is a crucial factor for being a match, then okay, yeah, that's gonna matter to you. Awesome. Um, what is the recommended amount of time a couple should be speaking over the phone, texting? I'm in a four month relationship and now because of quarantine, it seems to be difficult to figure out an appropriate balance. The person I'm dating has a lot more free time and always wants to talk. And I, on the other hand, feel like it's too clingy, too much. I'm not always in the mood of talking. I felt like this a little bit before the whole quarantine situation, but now I feel it even more. I think this person is great, but do you think this personality difference is a problem long-term? The person I'm dating thinks it'll be different if we were married because you see each other all the time and don't always need to be checking in on each other. However, I was always under the impression that these things don't change after marriage. You're correct. They don't change after marriage. What you experienced before quarantine is normal. What you're experiencing now is like the hyped up version of it. So you're getting like the normally life would be like before quarantine. And now this is like when you're stressed in life and world. And if you were married to this person and you were going through a stressful period, this is what it would be like. Not just quarantine, but any stressful time with anything family friend anything related if this person needs more contact and more connection then they are going to need a larger quantity of contact and connection than you're normally comfortable giving and if this continually exhausts you tires you stresses you out and doesn't work for you then long term you're going to be dealing with this and it's not going to change it is going to get more intense over time not less and more as you live with them not less i don't happen to agree with their opinion that it would be different if you were living together they would just be talking more so um it sounds to me like you're struggling through this i don't know how long you've been dating if you've been dating for three months already and this consistently irritates you but like fine whatever you'll get through it you'll be okay okay fine so move along with it and know that this is going to be one of the top things that irritates you in your relationship for the rest of your life until you let go of that. And if not, then, and this is consistently irritating you and even more so now, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just don't even know how I can deal with this anymore. Then you need somebody who's lower maintenance, less talky, lower maintenance in the talk category or more matched with you in the less need for conversation category. But if you also love that they draw you out in conversation and you don't have to work so hard to make conversation, then you should think about sticking with them because that's something that they bring to the relationship that's a huge asset. Just throwing that twist in there. <laughs> so bottom line, if you're not sure what to do, call Lisa. <laughs> yeah, just have a session. We, I work through the, this is exactly the type of questions that I work through and I've seen couples um, break up over this and I've seen couples continue and, and make this work. And, and wait, your specific question is how do we make this work now during quarantine? And the answer is set rules and boundaries. Like I'd love to talk on Tuesday and let's do a video chat and I'd love to text and I'm not available during the day because I'm working or whatever, but I'm available during these hours. And so don't expect me to get back to you and like set rules and boundaries and see if the person can abide by them, which they probably can't. But um, just say, this is what I need. And I have a different need than you do. And can we do this? And, and I think this would work for us and be healthy. Awesome. So this is coming from someone who I would say is from a more right-wing community, but how to navigate Shadokim when you're looking, or not, I don't know, but definitely Orthodox. How to navigate Shadokim when you are looking for a guy that doesn't fit in a specific box. For example, you want a very from guy, but someone who doesn't necessarily learn full time, which is generally expected. So the question is, how do you navigate that? Navigate. Um, you, and I, what you want when what you want isn't in the box. I kind of feel like as, as someone who was there for about 10 years, I kind of feel like this is very much where um, the personal dating plan and the, um, the perfect profile and soulmate summary come into play. Totally. So just, can you get a brief overview of those? Okay. Okay, so what you're describing is how do I explain to everybody else in the world, please don't put what I want in a box because it doesn't, you cannot check off these boxes to find what I'm looking for. I am looking for this, but with this twist over here and I'm looking for this, but with this flavor over there and a little like this and a little like that and you cannot check off boxes to find what I'm looking for. So because I've dealt with this a lot, I created a program called Daters Academy that has 
five different courses. And the two that Sarah mentioned, one is called The Perfect Profile and one is called Soulmate Summary. And both of those help to explain who you are and, what, and, and the other side, what you're looking for. And you've done that already and you do, fine, okay, okay, okay. But how to do that so that somebody else can hear it, right? When you speak, I understand you. I translate in my brain, I know what you mean. But when you say certain things, it triggers certain other people and it doesn't trigger them to hop and get that whole big picture of what you're explaining. So I like that we get very detailed and very specific and very nuanced in explaining what we're looking for and who we are and what's really gonna make sense for us so that when you have a conversation or when you write to somebody an email or when you somebody says, hey, what are you looking for? And you explain it in this like quick one liner that is actually sharp, it's on point, it's like, it nails it. And so Daters Academy has um, videos and worksheets and it guides you through the entire process of doing that. And it's built as a DIY program. You could do it on your own, do it yourself and, and accomplish it. And other people are like, Lisa, this is great, but like, I wanna work through it with you because it's just too much for me to handle on my own. So I also do it built in where you can buy the program and you can also get coaching on the side. It's, it's up to you how you wanna do it, but it sounds like you really need to get very specific how you explain what you're looking for so other people understand. And I love crafting these things. Like it's, it's, like, it's like a painting to me. It's like, a, it's a word, it's word art is what it is. I like it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, all right, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, when I'm looking at an online profile and I see someone who makes sense, um, no, sorry, I see someone who I sense has a lot of similarity, but I don't guess this is the one, would your opinion be to reach out or no? And I guess that that is just, how do I know when I should or shouldn't reach out? Okay, so we kind of don't know for anybody who's a gambler, like it's a crapshoot, like it's a, it's a roll of the dice, like is it going to be the one? Isn't it going to be the one? This one, you know, this one sounds so much more in line with me. I reached out to them and they're like, nothing like what I thought they were going to be. And this one is totally not what I thought I was looking for. Or, or somewhere in line with what I was looking for. But like, I didn't think it was going to work. And wow, it worked so much better. It still wasn't the one, but I was much closer. So the way, again, this goes back to like, do people actually describe who they are and what they want articulately? Or did somebody else write the profile for them? Did they not tell you what they really want? They only told you what the surface level thing. So if you see somebody that is sort of in line with what you're looking for, and I'm assuming, let's say you see a picture also, and the picture works for you and sort of what they're saying works for you, because we have more time to explore things now, I would say, give it a shot. And have a phone conversation, have a video conversation, just make an effort because we don't really know what's there. It's like a seed that you put into the ground. Every seed has the potential to grow and to be this amazing plant that, that transforms, whether it's an apple tree or a sunflower, like everything has this possibility. And some seeds you put in the ground and you water them and they die in the ground. They never sprout up. Nothing ever happens. Can you tell I got into gardening recently? Anyway, I totally recently took sunflower seeds. I planted them. I got ready. Every single seed sprouted. Now, I do have to tell you, I picked out two or three that I saw were dead before the sprouting even began. But other than that, every single seed sprouted. And I don't know which one's going to actually, like, make it up, you know, and actually work. But it, like, got the, it got the seedling out, like it's starting to get roots, it's growing. What's gonna work? I don't know what's gonna work. And we don't know what's gonna work for you. So give something a little bit more of an opportunity. Right now we all have a little bit more, not all of us. Non-essential workers tend to have a little bit more time on our hands or those that are working less or less frequently um, have more time on our hands. So explore it a little bit more if there's potential, but also if you got like five of these, and they're all like in between prioritize them and like start out with the one that has the most of the least potential and and see what happens awesome thank you um so again just wanted to point out that the a bunch of the last few questions were kind of follow-ups to different points that Aliza made which are a little bit more specific and require more variables and more information yeah. for Aliza to be able to address them properly so i'm going to drop the um I, I just dropped once more um, the link to schedule a 15-minute session with Aliza. 
do it right now. That's, it that's, a, that's a complimentary um, intro get to know you session. If we've never worked together and you're like, Aliza, I like this webinar thing. Like, tell me more about what you do and how you do it. Let me tell you what I need help with. We'll see if we're a good match for working together. That's a great time to do that. If you know me and we've worked together before, that session's not available to you because we've already worked together. It's only for new people. So um, for you, I am actually going to drop the over your hurdles. Um, link, which is just for one session. Um, Aliza, exactly. take it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and if you want to just work together for one session, we can do a 45 minute session. Um, I also have uh, a whole bunch of coaches that work with me and they're really fantastic. And so if my schedule doesn't work for you or my rates don't work for you or whatever isn't great for you, we have lots of options with people who are totally trained, ready to go and been answering questions like this for a while now. So all we want to do is be here for you. We want to support you through the process. And I really hope that by offering this webinar with information that you gain wisdom and information that you check out the previous webinar ways to date, you learn more information. That one, by the way, was like crazy long and ended up being two and a half hours. So if you, if it's like any question you ever wanted to know about dating, it's not all there, but like it's two and a half hours worth of there. So there's a lot of questions that we answered there about dating um, and relationships during this time and also in general. And also if you're in, if you're like, in the dating world and you're just like a little bit flipping out and you're like, I I'm kind of done with dating, whatever. Dating detox. I totally have a one week dating detox program. It's completely reasonable. It's, what is it? It's $99. It's a week long program. And we send you out videos and emails and worksheets that just help you go through the whole process. Um, and, and you also get to log into the back end. We have like a whole website set up ready to go with a special login for anybody who's there. So there's lots of way to, ways to get support if you would like to work with us because we would love to be here for you guys. And, um, and we'll put all that information in the email as well in addition to a link for this and a link for last week's workshop. And thank you. Um, thank you for thank coming you all for joining us. Asking questions and comments and tuning in from all over the world, and especially Israel. Go to bed. I love you. Go to bed. <laughs> and have a spectacular celebratory Seder, whether it's a Seder for one okay. or your Seder at someone else's Seder. All right. All the best. All righty.